Welcome to the FAI Studios YouTube channel and greetings from the Golan Heights here in northern Israel. We hope you enjoy the teaching that you're about to watch. FAI Studios is the media division of Frontier Alliance International. We're a ministry focused on pioneering in the 1040 window, laying Romans 15 foundations where there are none. I want to encourage you to consider becoming a monthly supporter of FAI at $5 a month. $5 a month might not sound like a lot, but because of this growing international collective family of brothers and sisters who care about the work of the ministry, this pool of resources is growing every month, which enables us to pioneer, to labor, and to expand our initiatives across the Middle East and beyond. Thank you for watching, and Maranatha. Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study. My name is Dalton Thomas. Joel Richardson and myself have been leading a guided tour through the book of Revelation for the last year and a half or so. Uh, in this session, what I wanted to do is interject uh, in, the, in the middle of our flow. We're in chapter 14 right now, and uh, we're going to continue in chapter 14 for uh, a few more weeks, a few more sessions on, on this incredibly important chapter in 14. But what I wanted to do is give a bit of an interjection uh, to talk about some, let's say, current events and some prophetic forecasting of realities that are right now, I believe, mounting on the horizon and things that I think we should be aware of. Now, for those of you who uh, track with FAI, if you have the FAI app, if you don't, make sure you go download it. It's available on all major app platforms. For those of you who've been tracking with the FAI YouTube channel, you probably saw a few weeks ago we released a short film about a campaign that we're starting called the Bomb Shelter Campaign. Here in Israel, we live in, I live in the Golan Heights, I live in the north of Israel on the Syrian and Lebanese border, and one of the things that we have done over the last few years is worked on multiple fronts partnering with local Israeli authorities in meaningful ways. We worked in Syria with the Israeli army, we were working with the Israeli border patrol and some hot spots here in Israel to support them. We're working with the local municipality in the Golan Heights, as well as the Upper Galil. And one of the initiatives that we've just started is to rehabilitate bomb shelters in the north of Israel in a city called Kiryat Shmona. This is Israel's most northern city that's right on the Lebanese border. In fact, the border is up on the hillside that, that looks down on this small town. Now, this town has received more uh, munitions from Hezbollah than any other city in the world. This has been the most bombed city in the world. The only other one that competes with it is Kosovo. But in terms of Kosovo, was a shorter concentrated time frame that received uh, the heavy bombing, whereas Kiryat Shmona has been over decades. Now, there's been a small uh, window of quiet over the last number of years, but that quiet is going to come to an end very soon. Um, in terms of uh, Israeli security analysts, in terms of the army strategic planning and thinking, the big war is on the horizon on Israel's northern border. And so one of the ways that we as an organization operate where, wherever we are is to, to, to bless and to serve and to stand with the communities in which we live in the most meaningful ways possible for the preservation of life. A lot of what we do revolves around conflict zones, and normally it's in the middle of conflict that we do most of what we do. Now, I love this campaign because it's focusing on something that's preemptive. There are a couple hundred bomb shelters in very low-income areas that are not ready for war. They've been uh, really ruined and left in a really horrible state. So what we are doing is going through and rehabilitating them, cleaning them, preparing them for war, and giving the keys to the city council so that they can stay ready for war and they're not going to be left in ruin. So what I wanted to do is that, that backdrop of that campaign and initiative is actually connected to uh, prophetic understanding of what's ahead. And that's what I want to do, to do in this session is talk about what's ahead, because some people may look at it and go, bomb shelters, what does this have to do with anything? And what's the intersection with, with prophecy? Because Israel's northern border, if you know anything about prophecy, the northern border is real, where everything goes down in the end. Now, historically, it's where a lot of things have gone down in the past, but this is going to be 
the northern gate where everything goes down in the future before the return of the Lord. So it's a very, very significant place. Biblically, it's a very significant place for us personally. Um, this is where we live. This is where, this is our our hometown. We we love this town, Kirish Mona. And it's going to be the eye of the storm in the next big conflict with Hezbollah and with the Iranian proxies that are going to, going to be involved in this dog pile, this violent dog pile that's going to happen in uh, whether it's weeks, months, or years, we don't know, but it's going to happen. So the Israeli Strategic Planning Division talks in terms of not if, but when. So the planning and the preparation, all the military exercises, all of the, the brilliance of the Israeli army is really focused on preparing for the inevitability of this conflict. So what I want to do in this session is talk about the biblical backdrop to it, because the big biblical backdrop is going to be something that's incredibly important for us to understand in light of future events before the return of the Lord. And it's something that doesn't get a lot of airtime um, in terms of biblical prophecy teaching is understanding the wars that lead up to Jacob's trouble. Now, Jacob's trouble is the biblical term for the final conflict, the final unequaled, unprecedented, age-ending conflict, the war that ends all wars. But that gets a lot of focus. It's also called the Great Tribulation or the Great Distress. There's a lot of biblical terms for this final war, Gog and Magog. There's all these different terms. What I wanted to talk about in this session is the war, wars, and particularly a, a significant war that will be a context-setting prerequisite that sets the stage for Jacob's trouble. Now, I'm not saying necessarily that the next war that breaks out in the north is going to be that one, but it very well may be that one, and it may very well uh, lead to the big one. It might not necessarily be it, which we'll talk about the details of this, but when we do a biblical survey on the season before the time of Jacob's trouble, there's some very important uh, information that we need to understand if we want to have a right view of it. So what I want to do is read a passage from Ezekiel to give some context and then talk about what I, and, and I will say that what my uh, opinion and forecasting is about what's going to happen next. You know, this is a big question that we get asked a lot is, Dalton Joel, what do you think is next on the prophetic timeline? That's what I wanted to talk about in this session. So we're going to start in this, and I'm, I'm including this in the Maranatha Global Bible Study in the book of Revelation because... This is, I think when we understand the, it's one thing to study the book of Revelation and to feel like it's really far out, you know, it's a distant reality, but it's, it's actually not. They, these realities are going to be bearing down on us or our children, I think, very soon. So I wanted to unpack this very, very important prophetic passage in Ezekiel 38 and 39. So we've talked about this in previous sessions, but I think this gives some, some landscape and context to the book of Revelation that I think is really needed in these days. So we're going to start in chapter 38, verses 1 through 6, he, the prophet describes uh, the Antichrist, the final dictator, the finer, final invader, the final tyrant that leads a military assault on the land of Israel that leads to the return of Jesus, but that starts in the north of Israel. Ezekiel 38 and 39 is very clear that the, this, this wave, this invasion, this violation of Israel's borders begins in the north. So this is very, very important. I'm going to skip the first six verses. You can read them on your own. This describes all the nations that are going to be involved in this invasion. Now, all the nations that are mentioned here are Middle Eastern and North African nations. Joel's done a great job of unpacking this in previous sessions. You can get it on the FAI app or the FAI YouTube channel. There's a lot of teachings that we've addressed this. But what I want to do is address the calm before the storm. We're going to start in verse 7. Verse 7, be ready and keep ready. Interesting exhortation. Be ready and keep ready. You and all your hosts that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. After many days you will be mustered. In the latter days you will go against the land that is restored from war. The land whose people were gathered from many nations upon the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. So what's being described here 
is a context in which Israel, where the Jewish people have returned to the land from war and are now living in the land after a long period of time where the land lay desolate without Jewish presence on Jewish soil. So this is the, it's a new season in history that's being described in verse 7 and 8. Here's a critical line. Its people, the Jewish people, were brought out of the peoples or the nations and now dwell securely, all of them. So they were, they came out of a season of war back into the land, now inhabit the mountains of Israel and dwell securely or safely. Verse 9, you, meaning the coalition of nations and peoples, that follow this, the leadership of this final tyrant, you guys will advance, coming on like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land, you and all of your hordes, and many peoples or nations with you. So we have, this is the events. We have Israel as a land, territory, is dw dwelling in waste, meaning the Jewish people are not here. But after desolations of war, after a period of conflict, they come back to the land. I believe that that's what's happened over the last number of decades, the last 70 years. And now they enter a phase of living, dwelling securely, all of them, living in safety. And then a horde of Middle Eastern nations from the Middle East and North Africa come on like a storm and invade. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, on that day, on that day, thoughts will come into your mind. Speaking to, this is speaking about the Antichrist. The mind, the logic, the mentality, the strategic planning of the Antichrist. You will devise an evil scheme. It is evil. And say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. It's a very important phrase, unwalled villages. I will fall upon the quiet people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without walls and having no bars or gates, to seize spoil and carry off plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places that are now inhabited, and the people who were gathered from the nations, who have acquired livestock and goods, who dwell at the center of the earth. Now, the next verses are incredibly important, but let's, let's talk about this for a moment. If you've been to Israel or you watch the news, Israel's not in a place of living in safety and security right now. Since 1948, before 1948, with the first waves of Aliyah through the beginning of the 1900s to 1948 until present time, Israel has been engaged in a consistent perpetual state of conflict, both with neighbors around them and with the Arab population within Israel itself. For example, today in Jerusalem, and Hebron, and Jenin, and Ramallah, and in the Palestinian territories, there is conflict on a daily basis. That's one. Israel has not dwelt in peace since 1948. They're not dwelling in peace now. They're dwelling in a state of security, but that security is based on the, let's say, the the skills of the Israeli security establishment that's providing a degree of security. But what's critical in this prophecy here is it says that they're living without walls and without gates. Now, I, I live in a community in the Golan Heights. There's a gate, there's fences, and there's walls. Any community you go to in Israel is going to be surrounded by gates, fences, walls or checkpoints of some kind. There's a significant security apparatus here. Now, there is a wall in the Palestinian territories, an actual physical wall. Now, where the wall ends, gates and fences continue. Israel is a nation today of gates and walls and security apparatus because they're not dwelling safely and securely. Which means this, the time period that Ezekiel is describing is a very unique and unprecedented one in which the Jewish people in the nation of Israel are living in safety and security, which is the first time that it happened. This is a phenomenon that's taking place in Ezekiel 38. 
Now, this has led some Bible commentaries and rabbis and scholars to conclude that this is describing a future conflict after the Messiah has come. Now, there's a whole end times uh, framework that's built around this idea. It's a faulty idea. It's not true. The invasion of Gog and Magog is, is something that happens before the coming of the Lord. Now, we know that from Ezekiel 38 and 39 later in the prophecy because it describes the demise of these nations and the leader of this coalition of nations. We're not going to get into that because we've already covered this in detail in other sessions. If you haven't watched them, you can go watch them, but I'm not going to address that right now. What I am going to say is this. Ezekiel is describing a very significant phenomenon that takes place in Israel where the walls come down, the fences come down, the gates come down, and a sense and a consciousness of security, peace, and safety goes up. Which means this, something is going to have to give between where we are now and this day that's being described of safety and security. We're not living in that day yet. And that day must necessarily come before the time of Jacob's trouble. In fact, the time of Jacob's trouble comes in the context of unprecedented safety, security, and peace. Now look at verse 13. This is very fascinating. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all its leaders will say to you, Have you come to see spoil? Have you assembled your hosts to carry off plunder, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to seize great spoil? Now, who is Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish? This is Saudi Arabia today and European maritime borders. Tarshish. We're, we're talking here about Europe. We're talking about the Mediterranean powers. We're talking about Saudi Arabia and the Arabian Peninsula. That's very significant. They're asking the Antichrist. Europe and Saudi Arabia are asking the Antichrist, have you come to take? Have you come to lay waste to this people in this land and to, to occupy it, to take away spoils of war? Meaning... Saudi Arabia is in a relationship with Israel and Europe, Tarshish, which, you know, we could get in, we could get into the specifics of Tarshish is that, you know, Spain, European Union, Germany, Italy, what are, we, what are we talking about here? Without getting into the details of what, speculating what Tarshish might mean, what we know is in general terms, the Saudis, the Arabian Peninsula, and a contingent of Europeans will be aligned with Israel during this time and will be shocked by the violence that takes place in the land of Israel and will inquire of the Antichrist to say, essentially, what they're asking here is, what are your intentions? Are your intentions to occupy and to seize and to take? Which is what's happening. Verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, say to the Antichrist, Thus says the Lord God, on that day when my people Israel, my people, my people Israel are dwelling securely, will you not know it? You will come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, the north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great host and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud covering the land. In the latter days, I will bring you against my land. I will bring you against my land. This is a God-ordained conflict that is intended to bring about certain outcomes and consequences. But the point is God is behind this. It is an evil scheme, it says earlier, but God is involved in this. And we see this often in prophecies. We see the sin of man, the corruption and the violence of man, intersecting with the purposes of God, intersecting with the destiny of Israel, both as a people, a land, a nation, and a, a covenantal body. In the latter days, I'll bring you against my land, that, for this reason, that the nations may know me, when through you, O Gog, I vindicate my holiness before their eyes. This is just incredible. 
Now, I'm tempted to just keep reading because it's such a powerful prophecy because of time. What I want to do, if you skip down to chapter 39, verse 1, And you, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm sending you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshesh and Tubal. I will turn you about and drive you forward and bring you up from the uttermost parts of the north and lead you against the mountains of Israel. goes on to describe this military campaign and the outcome of this military campaign. But the point is this, if we look in, in broad chunks of time, we have multiple seasons of history being described in Ezekiel 38 and 39. Season one is Israel outside of the land and the land lying in waste because of Israel's exile. It's the season of exile. This was up until the 1940s, 1930s, 1940s. 1948, Israel becomes a nation. 1967, in the Six-Day War, Israel reclaims, repatriates here, the Golan Heights, the old city of Jerusalem, the Sinai Peninsula, among other places. Now, between 67 and now, 2022, it's been a season of ongoing conflict. And every decade, it's another evolution in the conflict, the what's called the Israeli-Arab conflict, or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. I don't think these terms necessarily get at the heart of this because it's much bigger than Israelis and Palestinians, especially considering the fact that the term Palestinian meant something completely different when Israel became a nation, meaning many Jews were, would call themselves Palestinians during that time. This is a term that took on new meaning after the 1960s. It was infused with a political narrative and a political meaning that was different up until that point, and it was used to build a narrative, which is why I don't think that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a good term. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's unhelpful in thinking about the broadness of this conflict. That's the next phase, is dwelling securely but with walls, dwelling in a, a state of, of ongoing conflict. Now, what we're, the season that we're approaching is a season of peace, safety, and security. The last phase, the last season, is the shattering of this peace. Now, what I want to talk about is what I forecast, what I see happening that sets the context for this dwelling safely and securely, because I believe that the next big war in the north is not going to be Jacob's trouble. It's the war that sets the context for this deceptive peace that is going to, in a way, <clears throat> rock to sleep and lullaby both Israel and the nations into believing that we've entered a new era of peace in the Middle East and safety and stability. I want to talk about what's happening with that. But be before we talk about that, what I want to... Uh, uh, says that the New Testament builds off of this framework in a very significant way. Jesus and the apostles all unpacked, including the book of Revelation, describe a season of dramatic twist and turn in events from a season of peace to a season of violence and calamity. Now, Jeremiah unpacked this in multiple places in Jeremiah, and he said this, when they say peace and safety suddenly this great trouble will break out. Suddenly this, this, this season of trouble for Jacob will break out. In Jeremiah 30, he describes the, this, this uh, context of peace where everyone is talking about, it's peace, it's peace, it's peace. And suddenly Jacob's trouble comes. Now, Jesus described this as well in Matthew 24 and in Luke 21. He said, there's going to be a season of peace and then it's going to come like a snare on the whole earth. A snare snaps quickly. Now, this final trouble is going to snap very quickly. Paul said that the same thing to the Thessalonians. He said, Thessalonians, look, before the return of the Lord, people are going to be talking a lot about peace, peace and safety, peace and safety, and suddenly destruction will come upon them. The same thing happens in the book of Revelation. We have a, dis a season of peace that everyone's anticipating, and then all of a sudden the violence breaks out, and it comes swiftly, and it comes hard. And it comes in a context that's going to be, the contrast is going to be so shocking because people are going to be anticipating, they're going to be celebrating the peace, they're going to be anticipating longevity of peace when everything is going to break out. And it's going to come very, very fast and very, very hard, and without, uh, without, forecasting. 
Many people are not going to be ready for it. That's what the prophetic scriptures say. Now, Ezekiel establishes it very clearly and openly and says that they're going to be dwelling in unwalled villages and they're not going to be ready for it when the evil scheme comes into Gog's mind and he leads the coalition, forms the coalition, and leads the invasion. And we know during this time, we're going to get to this in later sessions, but the harlot Babylon is in relationship with Israel, which is touching the whole earth. And the nations of the earth are drinking from the corruption that comes from Israel's relationship with the harlot Babylon, which means the Middle East is going to be split down the middle with those who are drinking from the cup of the harlot and drinking from the cup, so to speak, of the alliance between the harlot and the international community that Israel is involved in because it's bringing incredible wealth, incredible wealth. That's another dynamic in the prophetic scriptures that is kind of a hallmark of this season of peace. It's not just a season of peace. It's a season of incredible wealth and financial explosion. Now, what we see right now in the Middle East is a bunch of nations that are struggling economically. You know, we could go through the list, you know, from Jordan to Egypt to Lebanon to Syria to Afghanistan to Iraq. You can go through all these countries and go, okay, all these countries are in financial turmoil. But what we see before the time of Jacob's trouble is that there's a season of unprecedented wealth in the Middle East. And Israel is living in a state of unprecedented wealth. And that's part of the reason that the relationship between Israel, the Saudis, the Jordanians, and the Egyptians, and let's say the moderate Sunni bloc in the Middle East, is going to enter into an interest-based relationship with the Israelis that's going to contribute to this deceptive season of peace that's going to be shattered violently by the Antichrist's invasion. So with that said, let's talk for a few moments about how are we going to get from where we are now to that day? Specifically, how do we get from where we are now to living in unwalled villages? Because for anyone who lives in Israel or anyone who's been to Israel, you know how serious the security situation is on a daily basis. I mean, just a month ago, there was a wave of terror attacks in safe areas in Israel. Like, it's, it's common to hear about, you know, stabbings in Jerusalem or attacks in Hebron or ongoing tensions in Gaza or something in Janine or, or somewhere in the Palestinian uh, neighborhoods where the army is clashing with Palestinian terrorists. This is happening on a daily basis, weekly basis, monthly basis. How do we get from there to Israel saying, we don't need walls, we don't need gates? You're going to see this, mark my words, you're going to see in the years and potentially decades ahead, political messaging within Israel emerging saying, we don't need all these walls and gates anymore. We came out of the ashes of the Shoah of the Holocaust into this cauldron of conflict and war. We needed the gates. But today, we've achieved something miraculous. We've achieved peace with our neighbors. And our neighbors have achieved peace with us through the building and the relationships and the building of trust and mutual interests. We see today Israel is nurturing relationships with the Arabian Peninsula, with the UAE, with the Saudis. We see an incredible, uh, it's been called the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords were, you know, Mara you can now fly to Morocco direct from Tel Aviv. There's nations every couple months who are throwing into the Abraham Accord movement and stream of history and saying, yeah, we want to normalize relations. Now, other nations are saying no. Like last week, the Iraqi parliament was voting on a law to criminalize relations with Israel uh, up to the penalty of death. If someone normalizes relationships with Israelis, you could be killed for it. Iran, Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, the Middle East is not all, uh, you know, happiness and roses and falling in love with Israel and Israel falling in love with them. Like, for example, the skies opened over the last few years for Israelis to fly to Dubai and for people from Dubai to fly to Israel. And there's this constant back and forth and the Israelis are going to Dubai. It's amazing. And the, du the people from Dubai are coming here. And there's a massive movement in the Arab world in the Middle East that's normalizing relations with the Israelis and Israelis normalizing with them because they want peace. It's, which is interesting because it's actually a beautiful thing. I think it's beautiful when Israelis can fly to an Arab country 
and go eat dinner in a restaurant surrounded by Arabs and it, they don't have to look over their shoulder and wonder if they're going to get, you know, stabbed or blown up and vice versa. That Arabs could come from the Arab world and come visit Israel and feel safe, that they could feel welcome, that they could feel at home here and respected for who they are and where they come from. This is a reality that's happening right now in the Middle East. I believe that this is going to also contribute to the sense of peace that comes because of the next war. The thing is, the Abraham Accords is only going to get the peace situation so far. The Abraham Accords and the political movements and all of the messaging and the relationship building and you know, different uh, foreign powers being involved in it and nurturing it. The Trump administration did, it made incredible gains on this. The Biden administration is taking it in backwards. It's not m moving. No one wants to talk to the Biden administration for the Middle East. So that it, it stalled out. But the point is, it's moving forward on the ground now and it took on a life of its own. Normalization with the Israelis is happening. Saudi Arabia is right on the cusp of fully normalizing. Now, they normalized with Israel behind the scenes in an intelligence capacity many years ago, but the Saudis are, are moving slowly, slowly to fully normalizing with Israel on every single level. It will be common soon for Israelis to fly to Riyadh and for Saudis to fly from Riyadh to Israel. And it's going to be very normal in terms of business and tourism and commerce and technology and security and, 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 and which I believe is going to be one of the contributing factors to the rise of the harlot Babylon and one of the contributing factors to the context setting of this final stage and season of peace that's shattered by the invasion of the Antichrist, which leads us to the next big conflict on Israel's northern border. I believe, and I'm going to tell you now, this is not, this is not from the Bible. This is from forecasting and understanding what's going to happen, from um, me understanding what the army understands, and what's in the air. What do I mean by that? Right now, from a strategic assessment from the army, from security analysts, from anyone who knows anything about the region, is saying that the next big war that is, it, that is inevitable is going to be between Israel and Iran, and it's going to be meted out primarily, not only, but primarily on Israel's northern border with Lebanon and Syria, where Iran has opened up a front of war and is intentionally planning and building up for this conflict. Now, Hezbollah, over the last number of years, has been stockpiling tens of thousands of long-range, short-range, mid-range rockets and missiles, as well as strategic weapons that's been funded and built either by Iran or with the support and the logistical and scientific and technological support of Iran. The proxies of Iran are all over the Middle East and they're focused on this northern border and Israel knows that. Now the thing is, if you talk to Israelis today in the military establishment or outside of it, anyone who knows geopolitics understands that the main existential threat today is the Iranian regime for two main reasons. One, strategic weapons in the form of nuclear and non-nuclear weapons, meaning weapons that will come from Iran here directly, or weapons that will be shipped through the Middle East to Israel's northern border and then fired from somewhere inside Syria or inside Lebanon into Israel. That's the strategic nuclear threat. The other one is the over 100,000 rockets and missiles that are currently on Israel's northern border in Lebanon. Now, those rockets are being stockpiled because Hezbollah understands that a massive part of Israel's security apparatus is her Iron Dome. The Iron Dome intercepts incoming rocket fire. Anytime that there's a new altercation in Gaza, you see it happening. Hamas, Islamic Jihad, fires rockets from the Gaza Strip, and Israel intercepts them to protect the civilian regions in Israel. Now, the thing is, over in the last war with Hamas, you had about 4,000 rockets fired during the duration of that war. The last war with Lebanon, you had about 4,500 rockets fired during the, the whole duration of that war. In the next war, you're going to see at least four to 5,000 rockets being fired every day. The logic, the intention, the purpose of Iran's proxies and Hezbollah is to overwhelm and to deplete the Iron Dome very early on in the conflict, 
which is going to mean that this conflict is going to be very fast, very hard, very heavy. And Israel is going to get absolutely battered by it. The North is going to look like what the Ukraine looks like right now. It's going to be hammered. And the Iron Dome is going to do its work, but it will be depleted. The Iron Dome reaches depletion at the end of almost every one of the conflicts in Gaza. In fact, that's why the conflicts in Gaza come to an end is because the Iron Dome is getting depleted. Now, Israel is developing new technology, lasers. There's all kinds of new stuff that they're developing. But the point is, the next conflict is going to be so brutal and so violent from the Iranian side that Israel's response to it, even if it's preemptive, whether Israel does a preemptive strike and it kicks off or Hezbollah starts and Israel responds, the response will be proportional to Hezbollah's commitment to go all the way meaning to throw down and to absolutely pummel the state of Israel. When they attempt that, Israel's going to respond very, very swiftly, very, very hard, which is probably going to look like the elimination of Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, very quickly. It's going to look like the elimination of all of the strategic weapons and factories and launch sites all over Lebanon and Syria. It's going to look like targeting Iran, nuclear facilities, and leaders of the nuclear program inside Iran. All of this is going to happen very fast and all together. And my point in saying this is because the day after this big war, the day after this conflict with Iran and her proxies, is going to set the context, I believe, for the peace that Ezekiel describes, the peace that Paul describes, the peace that Jesus describes and warned us about. This peace is going to be deceptive because today, if you eliminate, here's, here's what we know. If you eliminate Iran from the Middle East and her influence in the Middle East, Israel would take a massive sigh of relief because in the end, Jordan is not the most warm relationship with the nation of Jordan, but no one's anticipating strategic weapons from Jordan. Egypt normalized decades ago, but it's not a great relationship on a, you know, uh, an organic level. It's strategic and diplomatic and it, it's normal but it's not great it's not like america the united states of america and israel's relationship which is very very strong it's something else but israel's not worried about egypt using strategic weapons you know you could look at the saudis israel's gonna look at the saudis and go we're not worried about the saudis turkey now i think turkey is really the big threat but Turkey today is not threatening the use of strategic weapons against Israel. The only nation in the world today that's threatening that and has the capabilities is Iran and Iranian proxies that are currently on the ground in Lebanon and in Syria. This is what we're looking at. And if you take that factor off of the table, Israel is going to be living in unwalled villages, dwelling securely, dwelling safely. Why? because the threat has been eliminated. It's my opinion and my forecast, my understanding of current events and prophetic events that the intersection of these two, both current and prophetic, is that the next big war on Israel's northern border will be the context-setting war that sets the stage for a season of unprecedented peace that is gonna totally reconfigure and reshape the Middle East and the world at large. Because this season of peace is going to bring about new economic, technological, military partnerships across the Middle East and the international community that's going to completely revolutionize and completely reformat and reprogram and reconfigure the Middle East as we know it. And that reconfiguration of the Middle East is going to be the environment, the landscape, and the context in which... Gog, the, the little horn, the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, all these names for this final dictator, this final tyrant, that's the environment that he emerges from. So this is very high and lofty, like prophetic end of the age scenarios here. For us as an organization, we don't want to just understand it and teach it and talk about it. We want to be involved in the preservation of life. We want to be in involved in being a witness to those who might potentially be involved in this final assault to say and to warn them. This is why as an organization FI is working in Israel standing with the Israelis, the Jewish people, and we're also 
working quietly in all of the countries around Israel. We're actively involved all over the Middle East for the purpose of engaging hearts and minds in the context of the coming day of the Lord. Now, this means that we're in very interesting situations all over the Middle East, much of which we can't talk about because if we did, it would jeopardize either our teams and leaders or the people that we're partnering with on the ground who've opened the doors for us to operate on the ground in all these countries. And our partnership with the Israelis, our our collaboration with the Israeli army in the past, our collaboration with the Israeli security forces today is something that is a problem for some of the nations around in which FI is working. I say that to say this, if you want to get involved, a very critical way that you can get involved is by supporting and standing with FAI teams and leaders that are on the ground, both in Israel and around Israel. And one of the ways that you can get involved immediately is by supporting the bomb shelter campaign. Why? Because once this next war kicks off, there is going to be catastrophic loss of life in towns and villages on Israel's northern border that are going to be pummeled by Iranian funded, Iranian manufactured weapons that are going to come from either Syria or Lebanon or directly from Iran. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to prepare these, there's a couple hundred of these bomb shelters that are not yet ready for the war and they're in low income neighborhoods and low income housing complexes where the people can barely pay to keep the electric on and barely pay to feed their kids. They can't afford to overhaul a bomb shelter which is very sad because it means that these communities that are right now struggling to survive are soon going to be under the barrage of rocket and missile fire from an apocalyptic genocidal regime in Tehran who is pushing the Middle East to the brink of apocalyptic war. Now, what we know from scripture is this, this war is not going to go in the favor of Iran and her proxies. I believe that this war is going to put Israel in a, a, a significant advantage. And this significant advantage that Israel will be in after this conflict in the demise of the Iranian regime is, gonna, is going to do something that we can't even anticipate right now at all in terms of the scale and magnitude and scope of this reconfiguring. Now, a lot of people don't understand is that it's not as though Iran and Israel are the only one, it's not as though Israel is the only entity in the Middle East that has issues with Iran. Almost every country in the Middle East has issues with Iran that are very, very uh, strong, very, very significant, very, very consequential. The conflict between the Saudis and Iran is massive. In Iraq, the nation of Iraq today is completely divided over the issue of Iran. Some are pro-Iran, some are very anti-Iran. The same thing in Syria. The, the Syria today is 85% Sunni. The Sunnis do not like the Iranian regime who propped up the Assad regime and enabled him to be victorious over the revolution, which was moderated Sunnis at the beginning trying to overthrow a Shiite regime. Which means this, my point in saying that is this, the Middle East is going to be in a very, very different landscape without the threat of the Iranian regime. The Saudis are going to have a very different day after when the Iranian regime collapses, when Hezbollah collapses, when their apparatus and infrastructure in Syria collapses. And now with the dynamic of what's taking place in Russia and Ukraine and, and Russia being marginalized on the world stage and being hurt economically and their weaknesses as a military being put on display for the whole world to see, this is also going to factor in. Why? Because Russia is aligned with the Iranian regime. Russia is aligned with the Assad regime in Syria. Russia is aligned with Hezbollah and Lebanon and has been a key mediating factor and player in the conflict between Israel and, and Hezbollah and between Israel and the Assad regime. Russia has been a key uh, mediator and player in all of this. With Russia's influence waning because of what's happening in Ukraine, this is also going to contribute to the volatility of the situation with the weakening of the United States of America, both domestically and internationally, the weakening of these long-held status quo players is going to contribute to this next conflict in a significant way. And that next conflict, I believe, will set the stage for the final phase of peace, which sets the stage for Jacob's trouble. I hope this was helpful in the next 
on our next sessions, we're going to jump back into the book of Revelation. But I, I wanted to do this session because I think it gives context to where we are in the prophetic timeline. And it helps us absorb the information of the book of Revelation in, a, in a, I think, a more real and tangible way where we can taste the flavors and the resolution and the pixels are much more clear than they are when we're just reading it as a speculative, speculative book of prophecy. When we realize that, no, this is actually... It's very possible and probable that we're living at the beginning stages of the conflict that's going to lead to the war that ends all wars. So I hope this was helpful. If you'd like to give and donate financially towards the bomb shelter campaign, please do so. There's a link below. You can give safely and securely, and all of the money is going to go to the bomb shelters. If you give through the link that's connected to designating the funds to the bomb shelters, all of that money goes to the bomb shelters. It's not going to anything else but refurbishing and, and uh, preparing these bomb shelters in Kirich Mona for the coming conflict. Guys, thanks for watching this. As always, Maranatha.